are the, the people in the Office of Vice President for uh, Research. And those two people are with us today in the form of Steve Cross back there at the back. Yeah. <laughs> And Monique Tavares, who's also at the back. So we always like to give people a good run for their money. Uh, what I have to do is to apologize because the other Georgia Tech trait is that often you are double booked for everything that you do. And so I'm double booked right now, but I will be back before the end of the day Catch the beginning of this panel, the ending of the next panel, and we do have a little reception, I think, at the end. Uh, what I wanted to ask Janet to talk a little bit about, though, before we start, is the camera. Because what I'm hoping is that I will have easy access to what I miss. Yes. Yeah, the camera is here. Okay. So if you have to miss anything, because we often have to go out to teach or things like that, have other meetings, know that the sessions are being recorded and will be easily available in Smart Tech. If you don't know what that is, figure it out. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, gosh. Yes, from the School of Economics will be the, um, the, the uh, moderator for this session. Well, um, welcome to the panel on inequality. Poverty, Inequality, and Development, and we have two uh, researchers from uh, School of International Affairs, and one is from School of International Affairs and Computer Science, um, uh, Kirk Bauman, uh, Michael Best, Shatakshi uh, Dwandia from Economics, and myself, and we'll talk about our research and how it relates to the question, questions today. Kirk? This way, right here? Okay. Welcome and thank you for coming out and thanks to all that organized this. I would have to say that to give full credit, it was a, a little over a year ago that Shitachi kept bombarding me with emails about trying to start a working group at Georgia Tech on development and inequality and poverty. And this is kind of a culmination of that hard work that she started all that time ago. And it's great to see it come to this type of fruition. Um, I think my research for a long period of time is, uh, has a couple of threads that go in common. And one is my research, whether in Fiji or Central America or South America, um, all deals with issues of inequality and, and exclusion on the one side. And on the other is field work that's driven, or research that's driven by uh, large amounts of field work, and often long-term longitudinal studies with lots and lots and lots of visits in the field. And that is driven by what I think is the more macro definition of my research, which is the desperation method. Um, I lead study abroad. I do every summer to different parts of the world. It gives me the greatest satisfaction of my professional career, and I think it's where I'm making the most long-term impact. And with the rhythms of study abroad, I'm unable to take semesters and, of course, summers off. So I have this dilemma, how do I build research? And the desperation methodology is to figure out where are you going to be in the next 10 years and try and develop research questions that will allow you to do field work over this long period of time um, and that turns out to be, I think, a very fruitful, uh, maybe high risk, but fruitful because it's largely inductive um, and you sometimes have some idea what you're studying, but you don't know what important thing you might say until uh, a long time down the road. And that's going to be uh, part of the research that I'm going to talk about today is one of these particular types of projects. I'm, I'm interested in, in issues of inequality. My, some of my early research was on the um, Kuznets inverted U curve. Um, but more recently, I'm 
I'm interested in looking at issues of access and uh, exclusion and inequality and the implications that that has for growth. I think that's a really useful way to look at inequality because everyone then is a stakeholder. If we just look at the normative issue of inequality and the suffering of those that don't have, um, right now that falls on deaf ears. But if we can um, show the, the really dramatic effects of inequality on long-term growth for um, economies, and there are a number of economists and social scientists undergoing this for the United States right now, that one of the reasons that the U.S. economy cannot really get back on track is that the levels of inequality are so high that consumption is, is uh, constrained. Um, there's a lot of this debate going on in, in Brazil that the real magic of the recent Brazilian economic boom was a dramatic decline in the size distribution of inequality. And so this, this research that I have today is on um, tourism. And it's a look at tourism in three cities in Latin America, three global cities, three great cities. It's one of the benefits of this particular desperation research model that I have is I get to do it in fabulous places. And uh, in this case, it was in uh, Buenos Aires, Havana, and Rio de Janeiro. And I want to talk about uh, the um, political uh, policies that the local tourism authorities developed in these cities, and in particular on how inequality and social exclusion was a dramatic constraint on the policy options of these particular leaders and on the growth of tourism um, in these three cities. So here is my methodology. I did 484 interviews over the period of time, uh, 1999 to 2011, in lots and lots of trips where the students were off doing other stuff. And I was running around doing interviews in those particular cases. And I call my, my methodology prospective comparative process tracing. Um, there is this methodology of, of uh, retrospective comparative process tracing that's quite um, common in the social sciences with a small number of cases where you try to use the historical research and the, uh, the secondary record and interviews to develop a compelling comparative argument that includes sequence and agency to make a claim, a causal claim, of, of what caused two cases to end up at different points. But in my case, I do it prospectively. So I don't know what the outcome is going to be when I begin, which has all sorts of problems of never knowing if I'm going to find something particularly interesting. But at the same time, I'm not selecting on my dependent variable either, because I don't know what that variance in the dependent variable is even going to do. But I did have some inputs and some outputs that I wanted to look at to help structure these, these interviews. And um, those two inputs were the bureaucratic choice and social structure. And the outputs are the growth of international tourism and the distribution of those benefits to the people of those particular cities. Um, and the bureaucratic choice was interesting because this research started just at about the time that Latin America identified international tourism as one of the key foundations for their economic growth. International tourism now is a trillion dollar industry. And in the region, international tourism from 2000 to 2010 grew at about 37%. So it was a, this boom period of time. And, and what cities did at this particular time was push very hard to um, um, try and rebrand their cities to make them uh, tourism destinations. And they created or they beefed up local tourism authorities. So new institutions were created across a lot of cities and even a lot of countries in the, in the 1990s and early 2000s. And so as a political scientist, it's really interesting to see these different institutions as they take shape and then see what happens to them over uh, this period of time. Um, and one of the, the changes that's happening that's, that, that I found interesting as I went through this was that the, these tourism ministries 
we're, we're no longer a traditional Weberian bureaucracy. They were not following uh, um, policies of best operating procedures. They were not um, trying to do the standard bureaucratic activities. But they, to compete in this segment, needed to be much more entrepreneurial. They had to take on certain business qualities. And in order to be innovative, and to have innovation was really one of the more important elements of having a unique brand that could be successful in this very competitive industry, we started to get these entrepreneurial and innovative bureaucrats in some places, but in, not in others. So let me talk just a little bit about each of these three cities. They're great places. If, if you haven't been there, I would recommend each of them. And, and Buenos Aires is an interesting city structurally because the city itself, which is about 3.2 million, in the metropolitan area is about 11 million people, but the city is 3.2 million, is made up of this, this mosaic of identity-inspired uh, neighborhoods. And uh, this became the key to the tourism model for the city that was led by a, a man named Hernan Lombardi. And Lombardi's vision of tourism was actually quite radical. His vision was that all tourism is culture. All tourism is culture. And when he was asked to be the minister of tourism for the city, he said, I will only be it if I am also the minister of culture for the city of Buenos Aires, which gave him a tremendous advantage because the tourism budget for the city of Buenos Aires is approximately $5 million a year. The, the culture budget is $280 million a year. And so he was able to bring these together and drive a very interesting model where what he believed was that if you, if you did this effectively, you could have a number of, of benefits. And what they tried to do was find niche cultural markets where Buenos Aires could become the leading light, largely in South America, but also from Europe. So you would have uh, the largest book fair in the Spanish-speaking world, um, and you would have a million, uh, 100,000 Argentines, and 100,000 visitors from other countries. And you would do this with design fairs, with tango, with uh, uh, culinary activities, um, and in a big way with the gay community because the gay community is a, a sector that can participate in both the creation of a new cultural identity and through the word of mouth can uh, uh, help create Buenos Aires as the trendy place to go uh, in the hemisphere. And, and so, you, but the key for this to, to work was that it maintain its authenticity and for that to happen, in all of these activities, there had to be more locals than tourists. So if there ever was an event that had more tourists than locals, then this was not going to work at the long term for the type of cultural branding that Buenos Aires was trying to achieve. But to do this, you had to constantly be expanding the cultural footprint. So if we look at the city center here, you have to start expanding by uh, using the identities of the various neighborhoods to keep pushing out and including the local cultural, uh, cultural activities with a majority of locals and a minority of tourists. Or as the number of tourists that uh, continue to grow, they would just overwhelm the local activity. And this was only, of course, possible because of the relative high level and the very large middle class that are both consumers and participants and creators in the cultural activities that became the, the brand and model of tourism in the city. Very quickly, another case is in Havana, Cuba. And again, the synergies that the uh, effective minister of tourism for the city of, of Havana had 
is he is also the city historian, Eusebio Leal. And the city historian in 1993, when Havana was in the worst of its crises, and a reporter from the Telegraph was in the city taking a picture of a beautiful old building, and it crumbled right in front of his eyes as he was taking pictures of it, was that they needed to renovate. And so uh, Eusebio Leal, a historian, went to the communist leadership and made a deal unprecedented in the history of Cuba where he would essentially be the pope of Old Havana, this glorious place with thousands of historic buildings, and he would control all negotiations and all money for tourism. The city historian's office would run hotels, they would lease hotels to uh, uh, foreign capital, they would do all of this and they would control all of the money and the deal was they would keep half of it to renovate the buildings and they would give half of it to the state. And he got this deal because, uh, as prospect theory tells us, Cuba was very much in the domain of losses and they were big risk takers because they had no choice in the special period of the 1990s. And so he was able to, to create this, but it, the tourism is much different than in, 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 uh, in Buenos Aires because while you don't have a lot of inequality between the locals, you have this tremendous amount of and different modalities of inequality between the tourists and the, and the locals themselves. And very quickly, Rio de Janeiro, the tourism zone is down here in Copacabana and Ipanema, and geographically you have these lagoons and mountains that divide those areas from the rest, and they have kept with a very stagnant tourism policy because human capital is so low and crime is so high that they have been forced to maintain what we could consider an urban enclave tourism model that has been not very useful for the majority of the people who live in Rio de Janeiro. We can see here the growth of tourism both in percentage change on the right and in millions of tourists and you can see this that Buenos Aires and Havana had relatively dramatic, much higher than the regional average, whereas in Rio de Janeiro, in this decade of a tourism boom where they hosted the Pan American Games and got the World Cup and the Olympics, tourism to Rio de Janeiro actually declined because this generic sand and sea tourism is one of the models that's on a decline itself. And so we can classify tourism on these Social scientists love these three by three matrices. This is mine, where you have your social structure on the left and your policy choices on the right. Buenos Aires and Havana both have entrepreneurial and innovative policies. Uh, Buenos Aires also, because of its structure, has uh, inclusive tourism. Um, and Rio de Janeiro is, is a place that has very stagnant, Weberian policies and also is stuck because of its social structure with this urban uh, enclave tourism. And I guess in, in my final comment would be a question of where would we put Atlanta on this particular uh, three by three matrix and what are the reasons and the ramifications of putting the Civil Rights Museum not in near the King Center but right down here next to Coca-Cola. Thank you. Good afternoon. So I am indeed Michael Best. Uh, a few weeks ago I grew some facial hair, which still seems to be scandalizing faculty members and sending ripples across campus. But, uh, uh, Georgia Tech faculty member grows facial hair. But I am indeed uh, Mike Best, and I'm delighted to be here. Um, as a departure maybe from my uh, uh, the earlier speakers, I'm not going to thank the organizers or the sponsors because uh, I think we're among friends, and what instead, even though I'm thankful, uh, I want to say is I'm super excited that this room is packed and there's a lot of energy, because uh, some of us sometimes feel uh, like those of us who work in development and poverty issues um, maybe don't always get uh, a lot of connections on campus, but I think that's probably because we haven't organized enough of these events yet, so I'm, I'm very excited. 
In my research, I'm examining the role of computer and communication technologies, in particular the internet and mobile telephony in economic and political uh, and social development, primarily in low-income countries in Africa, uh, somewhat in India and South Asia, and occasionally in Latin America and Southeast Asia. Uh, and I do that by studying and intervening in these countries by researching design aspects, building technologies, examining infrastructure, looking at empowerment and equi equity issues, uh, all within under-resourced communities. Kirk, if, if you're desperate, I think, are you desperate, was it? Yes. Um, I'm probably promiscuous. <laughs> so uh, while I focus on ICTs and development, I really seem to work across a, a rather broad range of areas into which computers uh, have a role in political, economic, and social de uh, development. So I'm going to give you a few staccato examples, tease you with some of the examples of that work, and then try to bring it all together. Um, uh, a lot of my work right now is focusing on the broad area of e-democracy, information and communication technologies, and political development. Um, and much of that has been looking at elections. In 2010, uh, I worked with a bunch of colleagues in Nigeria to develop a social media tracking technology and process through which we uh, sucked up social media material. That's things like Facebook, Twitter, Google+, Ushahidi. Um, and use real-time analysis on a, a technology we built here at Georgia Tech to uh, study and um, flag and tag instances of reported irregularities in the 2010 Nigerian election. We then were able to communicate in real-time through visualizations the, this social media analysis to a situation room that was staffed in Abuja, the capital of Nigeria, they then would respond to the particular social media reports that we were discovering through our analysis here in Atlanta. Um, this would be things like we would identify uh, a polling place irregularities, like a place, a polling unit that had run out of ballot papers. We would identify that through social media analysis, send that to Abuja, they would contact the election officials and they could send some poll, uh, uh, polling uh, ballot papers to the polling unit. Um, in the, after the presidential election, especially in the north of Nigeria, the, there was a series of violent outbursts and we quickly retooled the system to respond to incidents of violence. And we were able to identify acts uh, of violence, rioting, and other incidences that we communicated to our tracking center situation room in Abuja, and they actually then contacted the security forces who dispatched troops based upon our social media reporting and analysis. So that uh, process of developing both a system and a technology for social media tracking during elections evolved into something that also could respond to conflict, and then uh, moved from the 2010 election in Nigeria to a social media tracking center we did for Liberia during their election in 2010-2011 um, with the Situation Room here in Atlanta to the Ghanaian election last year to the Kenya election a few months ago and now we have a, 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 a quite robust I think series of projects to examine social media and uh, elections and, and political development. Related to that, and as you can see, that social media project responded to act, uh, incidences of violence in northern Nigeria, uh, ties in a broader 10-year uh, project I've been engaged with on peace building in a network world, or conflict and post-conflict computing. And this has included quite a range of projects, but most recently I've been working in Sierra Leone and Liberia to try to do policy work and infrastructure deployment as they uh, ready their country for the first fiber internet connection for the country. So uh, both Sierra Leone and Liberia have been connected to the ACE submarine fiber cable. That's it. Um, being dragged ashore in uh, Monrovia. 
And uh, this is the first time that both of those countries have ever been connected to the internet cloud via fiber optic cable. Prior, they only had satellite connectivity. Neither country has anywhere near the internet connectivity that we on campus have as just sort of a point of comparison. So in these two conflict-stressed uh, countries, countries that have been emerging over the last 10 years or so from very significant civil conflict and destroyed infrastructure, I've been collaborating with the government and with my lab here on campus to develop policy and infrastructure plans for the country so that if the ACE fiber cable is the supply, what are the demand drivers within the country and how can the, these countries ensure that they get value out of this uh, submarine fiber cable connection? In addition, I've been looking at ways in which information and communication technologies can enhance entrepreneurship and innovation thinking in post-conflict or conflict-stressed environments. And so we will be uh, deploying or creating something called the Zero Young Innovation Lab, uh, hopefully in the next few months. Um, we're, uh, I'm working with the World Bank on that, and we're having what they call the DM uh, on next week, which is the decision meeting, um, to uh, put together the catalytic $1 million for this particular innovation lab. And, and so that's another part of sort of thinking about ICTs uh, in a conflict stress environment towards peace building. And finally, another thing that I've spent a long time looking at in terms of peace building and computing is developing rich interactive media technologies that are particularly designed to enable post-conflict national healing. And so in this uh, system called MOSIS, which was deployed in Liberia and traveled throughout the country for a number of years, we actually built a system of interactive video story sharing that allowed Liberians to talk about their experiences during the civil conflict, to complain about things in Liberia at the time, to talk about sports scores, to, to, to rap hip hop songs, whatever. And we were able to show, actually, through controlled experimentation, that this went towards psychological uh, cueing that's been demonstrated to be critical in national healing and post-conflict reconciliation. So that's sort of the peace building side. And, and finally, um, in terms of sort of the portfolio that I just want to highlight uh, a few of these um, projects, uh, a new set of activities that we're doing to try to build civic innovation and network thinking in West Africa and using computer platforms and software engineering practice to help to kind of incubate or pre-incubate uh, innovative, uh, civic-minded, ICT-enabled projects. And so what this is in practice is going to be, one, a series of uh, curriculum innovations and innovations workshops in Nigeria with a, a series of what we're calling innovation fellows, uh, where we actually have um, a budget to fund uh, pre-incubation of projects that come out of this innovation process. We're working, um, this is in collaboration with colleagues at Harvard and a cast of thousands of uh, groups in Nigeria, and we're working to develop an, our initial cohort of these innovation fellows and then pre-incubate their work um, and part of the research from my angle is both to build platforms that support the innovation network and civic thinking, but also to look at software engineering practice and to try to examine whether there is something of an African software engineering approach. Um, after quite a lot of experience in the context of many of the traditional software engineering approaches that you might learn in the College of Computing uh, have some contextualized uh, challenges in some of these communities of practice. Go ahead. 
Finally, just because it's super fun, um, I'm uh, co-directing a program called New Media in Hollywood. Uh, the Nigerian film industry is the second largest film industry in the world. At its height, it produced 20 films a week. It is the second largest economic engine for the state of Lagos. It employs a million people. So, and it's uh, almost certainly the continent of Africa's largest and most significant cultural export. So one thing that the, new, uh, the Nollywood or Nigerian film industry is great at is making films. One thing that they almost universally feel unsure about is the role of new media, mobile media, and social media platforms around production, post-production, and distribution of these films. And so we've de been developing a very tight collaboration amongst many Nigerian filmmakers uh, and of, of sort of the academies there in, in producing uh, technologies, knowledge, and films that try to leverage new media, mobile media, and social media. One thing uh, was we did a feature length film, half shot on campus, if you can notice this is in front of Clough. Um, that little uh, uh, clip was in the Aware Home, um, just on the edge of campus. Uh, the, the film is um, going to premiere in Lagos in November during the Nollywood at 20 birthday event as one of the gala uh, red carpet events. And we'll probably do some sort of special screening here on campus as well. It stars two of uh, the Nollywood's biggest film stars. Um, if you were around, you've seen them on campus because they've been around a few times. It's uh, fun and kind of crazy. And if you can imagine sort of Nigeria meets Hollywood and the craziness of an intersection of that sort, it only begins to describe uh, what this project is like. Finally, we were asked to sort of say well, how we got into what we're doing. Um, some of you have heard this tagline from me before, what's a geek like me doing in a place like this? I'm trained as a computer scientist, but after, the, after uh, getting my PhD, the, the next day, I apprenticed myself to social scientists by shifting up three train station stops from MIT to Harvard and, uh, and becoming a fellow at the Center for International Development at Harvard University when Jeff Sachs was still there. <clears throat> so while my background actually goes into systems and massively parallel supercomputing, that was kind of my traditional computing area, I immediately um, <clears throat> graduated and started working in developing my capacity as a social scientist. And the one thing I promise you is I spent a lot of years of working on the world's fastest computers at the time, nowadays it's sort of slow, um, doing what we thought was the hardest programming in the world, which is system development on massively parallel supercomputers. But Social science is way harder, and humans are way more complicated than computers. So if anyone on this campus ever thinks that the tough, smart folks are the ones in engineering and science, I promise you, as a fallen engineer who's gone soft, uh, uh, the hard work is in the social sciences and a lot of what happens in Ivan Allen. Uh, and finally, we were asked to talk a little bit about methods, and I started off saying I'm promiscuous, and that's true both in the type of projects, but in the ways we go about doing it in my lab and across my collaborators. Uh, some of the work we do is design and engineering. We build systems in my lab, and especially folks who are on the computing side uh, have a, a propensity towards building systems, but I think uh, everyone should build things, um, whether it's a computer program or something that you build with your hands, I think building is a great way to be research productive, to understand where you're working at, and to engage the community in which you're trying to deploy your things in. We also do a lot of social science, and that uh, includes quantitative and qualitative methods. So um, in many of the projects I've described, we've done straight up quantitative controlled studies, but we've also done many qualitative studies, um, interviews, focus groups, that kind of stuff. And then I also do policy work. I mentioned that I'm working with the government of Sierra Leone and Liberia to understand how they're going to deploy infrastructure. Um, I have a tendency to work on national ICT policies for many countries. Right now I'm collaborating um, with uh, the development of a universal service obligation policy um, 
in West African countries. So that's kind of sort of policy work. And I would say that I'm quite interdisciplinary on almost everything that I've described. Um, I'm working with uh, teams that include uh, development specialists, poverty economists, me, whatever I am, and, uh, um, and usually a student uh, collaboration that crosses at least computing <laughs> and international affairs. So thank you very much. Um, thank you for spending your Friday afternoon here. Um, so, um, my name is Olga Shemekina and I'm an assistant professor at the School of Economics and my research focuses on the armed conflict and household behavior. So, basically um, what I'm studying here is actually when we are placed as people and as families in the situations of extreme uncertainty, how do we behave? And uh, I'll talk about it a little bit more. So. How does it fit into that project? Um, just to give you a perspective, uh, only in the last decade, about one third of the developing countries uh, uh, experienced some form of armed conflict or, um, or mass violence. And, uh, and if we add uh, recent conflicts, it probably would be uh, higher. I mean, overall trend in, uh, across the globe has been that the conflicts are reduced in the severity with respect to number of deaths. Uh, but um, they became more frequent. So, and studies on the aggregate uh, impact of armed conflict, looking at the growth perspective, say that um, countries uh, go back on track pretty fast. Within 15 to 25 years, population growth rate is on track, uh, growth rate is on track, uh, country is doing well. There are studies on Germany, Japan, uh, Vietnam that shown that. Uh, but what the studies leave out is that um, conflict, I mean, fundamentally affects those who live through it, and especially, you know, families, especially young children who go through uh, periods of extreme deprivation. And there is a growing body of research that finds those results, those effects are long-term, they're lasting, and very often they're not reversible. So there is a, some research that's going on uh, looking at the catch-up, um, especially with respect to human growth. Let's say if you were deprived of food in early childhood, if you are supplemented later on, uh, whether you go back on track. I mean, somewhat, but it has to be early, early on. So my research focuses, again, upon the impact of armed conflict on households and individuals, and I studied uh, various issues. So far, I have like more concentration looking at the impact of conflict on education and health of young children um, and looking specifically for differences for boys and girls and for different countries. I also looked at the differences and how households use different coping mechanisms such as remittances and migration or labor market policies, uh, not policies, but participation, um, whether we go back to workforce, who actually does that, and how households actually conduct their activities such we don't think about scoping strategies as marriage or fertility. Do we marry faster or later? And when do we have children? So, um, and what is the big problem here is that, I mean, we all heard on the news and um, conflict uh, creates a lot of destruction. It results in large loss of life, uh, mass migration of population, and you have a uh, huge impacts. You have impacts along two sides, right? You have individual impacts, you lose assets, you lose uh, family members, uh, you uh, lose years of productive life, and uh, you have uh, 
sort of deprivation at a society level or at a regional level because infrastructure is often destroyed or see Mike is rebuilding some of it um, and it takes a long time uh, to go back uh, where you were before the conflict. And another thing which is different a little bit like when we often compare conflict also to natural disaster, natural disaster is a shock but it's purely exogenous often. Um, meaning that it came from not within the system, but from elsewhere. And um, while in conflict you have a lot of, I mean, it creates a lot of history and history of mistrust. So people stop um, trusting each other with respect. Like, and what does it disrupt? It disrupts trade a lot. And um, just basic human relationships. Um, so how did I get into it? Um, as a child, I grew up in Soviet Union, which uh, soon became former Soviet Union. And it was um, very, I mean, it's a lot of dis disruption. And I grew up in like, one of the uh, satellite republics of, uh, um, of Russia, like, uh, in Kazakhstan. And people were really concerned about how the change is going to happen. And I was uh, concerned about, like, as an adolescent, uh, like, do, are we going to move? is my family is going to move because I am ethnically not from that area. What we are going to do uh, when the currency, uh, when my country established a different currency, are we going to travel? How are we going to travel? When unemployment hit, what we are going to do? Uh, and I wanted to know what's going to happen actually to people. How do we respond in those situations? So it's kind of very interesting area for me. And it applies in many, I mean, there are many types of shocks uh, that people experience, and there are many similarities among them. Um, I mean, I already mentioned the economic crisis, are very similar to conflict-affected countries that sometimes people sort of um, stop having children during uncertain times. Uh, US data also shows that during the recession recently, the birth rate went down because people were not sure what's gonna happen. Uh, terrorism events. Even uh, sort of random shocks recently, and we change people's behavior. Because um, as an example, we went to visit my family um, in Boston during the 4th of July weekend. And I said, we both have children. I said, let's go see fireworks. Um, it's going to be fun. And we said, um, we don't go to public places with many people and with children anymore. So, and I was, oh, that's interesting. Um, because for me as a researcher, it is an impact, but um, that people change their behavior as a result of a pretty random event, right? Um, so I use uh, primarily quantitative analysis, which means that I work with large data sets, um, and I combine those data sets um, usually I don't collect my own data. I use data collected by the World Bank or um, other international organizations. Those data sets are somewhat standardized uh, across countries. So you can compare, for example, different countries um, one to another. And there's a large data sets between, let's say, 2,000. And if you combine a few, you can get as many as 10,000 records. So there's a large amount of data. And I combine this data with informational shocks. Uh, some of them I collected myself earlier using, you know, like scanning through newspaper records, scanning through books, looking at the mentions of conflict-related events. And, uh, and after that, it was my early research, and then I actually we have groups of um, researchers that started with kind of large projects. For example, armed conflict locations and event data set covers a bunch of countries in Africa and um, Asia, a little bit in Latin America, and they do pretty much the same that I did manually. We scan from news sources and we record each event by, one by one, where it's located, and you can actually map it in different areas. So uh, there are a few of those. Um, so I want to discuss a recent project, um, and um, I'm just gonna go over a few key points. I have a longer talk um, in a couple of weeks on August, on September 20th, so you're welcome to come. Uh, it's a joint work with Camelia Minayu, um, 
who was a country economist at Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, this is how sort of we got into it. And what we are looking here is the impact of a conflict, armed conflict that we had, um, a civil war, on the health of young children. So, and the research builds up and actually shows that studies, um, if you deprived, especially in early childhood, of food resources or health, um, access to health system, um, it's, it may stunt your growth and it may stand in permanently. So here we want to see um, the impacts in this country compared to other areas. And also what we have um, is um, actually very extensive data um, before and after, and we have a data on household level victimization. Typically, very few countries have collected that um, information. Um, and the country, I mean, the government actually went out it was the, the government that collected the data, and we went to actually to estimate how people were affected by that conflict. So just brief review of the conflict. It was, um, I mean, actually pretty standard five-year conflict, uh, large displacement of population, um, and um, relatively few casualties in comparison to many wars, it's about 600 in two years. Um, frequently you have conflicts that um, I think exceed 10,000 or more. So for example, for the case of Tajikistan that I studied, it was like 50 to 100,000. Uh, so it's pretty low scale in terms of number of deaths, but high in terms of displacement. So very comparable. So we took this accurate data uh, on events during the war and we mapped it to the regions. So we have households that come from these regions, so we connected this to sort of data points. Uh, it could be region at the camp and the match <coughs> to conflict uh, impact in that region. So the darker the area means that the more your area has been impacted. And uh, the country was sort of split into during the conflicts, north controlled by rebels and south controlled by government. And north didn't have much of the actually government services. Health professionals, educational professionals were paid. So there was a lot of um, dissatisfaction about the services there. But as you see at the sort of violent activity events, they are all over the place. So which means that sort of prevalent in the area. And they have um, if you don't find the new part, uh, you say it's zero, and anything out of shape of the uh, being marked as one. So this is just an example of a table that we would uh, typically run. It's an um, output of a regression table. And what we're interested here to see is just if you were born before or after conflict, and in a conflict area, um, by how much your height for age is and it's a technical term, but it's basically how much a child in Cote d'Ivoire deviates from a reference child in a population which has been not exposed to health shocks, so to a normal kind of child. And we find, so on average, it's about 0 0.3, 0 0.4 standard deviations, which means that like, if you're looking at three to four year olds, it's about two centimeters in height. So we are shorter by about 1.6 to 2 centimeters. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then we go on and we look, okay, like what particular mechanism has impacted you? So we differentiate between economic, health, displacement, and victimization. And actually here we see that uh, in any, pretty much all the instances, if you also live in the area which has darker shade area, based on you have more likely to report more victimization. So which is kind of um, interesting because it correlates with what we would expect to find. So, and we find um, that economic victimization tends to be very important. So households that say that we be victimized economically, they tend to have lower child health. So, but yeah. 
So, and how my research may be addressed in interdisciplinary approaches. And you saw, um, actually, it requires, I mean, it's pretty much every paper is sort of a case study, and it requires <coughs> extensive understanding of uh, institutional and historical environment around the conflict and before that, um, and social processes in the country. For example, I have a project on Zimbabwe that looks also at the land reform, and people have kind of opposing views on whether it has been effective or not, and you want to know who is right. Um, so, and you want to understand actually if your single research project's um, findings would be somewhat generalizable to our areas, right? And uh, sometimes it's not, because to an extent, um, Institutional environment often defines how uh, outcomes are being affected. And also you have to understand also sort of sociology behind like the distribution of resources, either by gender, originally, or between classes. So now also any other potential pathways, because what we want here like sort of to attribute causally impact what we are, I mean, the outcome that we are studying and the shock but there could be a bunch of other things that happen that we are not kind of capturing and you have to be aware of it. So that way, um, I mean, it's very important to get perspectives of, um, I mean, other social scientists about that. Thank you. Well, before I start, let me introduce uh, Jennifer Clark, who just arrived. Uh, thanks, Jennifer, for joining us. Good afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess she had a long flight, so. <laughs> All right, so. Um, great symposium to have on, especially at Georgia Tech, that we are talking about uh, opportunity and access research. And thanks goes to, of course, uh, Dr. Royster's initiative. We had Dr. Janet and Dr. Clark lead the initiative. And I know Kirk mentioned I had started bugging few people early on. Uh, but I realized I'm sort of new to Georgia Tech. I'm, oh, this is my end of second year, so third year. I realize that people are willing to talk and listen to you if you ask them for some time. And this is the best part that I've realized that I've talked to so many of the, of the people who are related to, in some ways, to my research. I've talked to Vicky, I've talked to Mike, I've talked to Kirk at some point, I've talked to Usha, who's in my department working on related developing countries, I've talked to Barbara at another point. So I've seen that there is an interest, even if it's not in strictly the same discipline that you are, that people are willing to listen to what you are trying to say, are there any possible collaborations? And I think that's uh, unique to Georgia Tech. So uh, let me s talk about the broad research topic we have. I think you have sort of seen that uh, we are talking about similar points which we decided on so as to keep the topic similar across different presentations. Um, why did someone choose a particular research direction? What are the main research questions? And then what are the interdisciplinary approaches that are possible collaborations with other people. Well, I'm an economist, and uh, there are many jokes about economists. And uh, I should humbly say that, yes, we more or less after the end of the talk, you say, oh, actually, that was obvious, right? Why did you have to do the whole research I mean, <laughs> stating something so obvious? And that, that happens pretty often. Um, having said that, Let's uh, see how did I move to a particular topic of poverty. So again, relating to Olga, I was studying in India. I was born and brought up in India where uh, there was this big wave of globalization hitting a country which was very regulated in the early parts since its independence. So till 1990s, the country was highly regulated. We had an economic crisis. We followed the IMF package and boom, there were economic reforms and we were part of this wave of globalization and many things were changing rapidly at that time and there were big political debates 
very similar to the academic debates we had here with Jeffrey Sachs assuming hands-off approach. We had Bill Easterly saying, no, we need to intervene even when we have fast economic growth. So there were tensions between economic growth on one side, which was coming naturally because of these free trade, free capital movement. But there was also a rise in income inequality in these countries. And where should we have or how should we have a balanced approach to that was one of the crucial things which was discussed in the political circles, in the economic circles. And that sort of attracted me to the type of research I was doing. You see this picture which would be from any of the developing countries, right? It's not very typical of uh, India itself, but uh, you would see this very close to a high-rise building or close to any of the downtowns. And then my research tended to look at these four different blocks. So I'm looking at poverty, but I'm also looking at economic growth because that's one big engine with which poverty is going to get reduced. I'm also looking at inequality, which is also increasing with economic growth and all of these are sort of flowing in the time period the particular framework that I'm looking at is the globalization so how did globalization impact all of these different things my different uh, study projects are looking at all of the different arrows that we see so I've looked at relation between growth and inequality is it always that inequality increases to what extent how different countries are comparing when all of them are into this liberalization mode. I've looked into just growth and poverty or just inequality and poverty. I'm choosing just one or two broad research topics or research themes in today's talk, which will, which will help me focus on So the first topic I'm looking at is the relation between growth, inequality, and poverty. So one is going to increase poverty if you have more and more income inequalities, if you have just the upper tail of the distribution, which is gaining because of growth. And of course, if the growth is what we call pro-poor or it's trickling down, then you will have much less poverty. So one of the exercises I did was you have a counterfactual scenario. So can we simulate? some kind of uh, economic scenarios where you would have certain economic growth but different type of distribution. Then what would have been the poverty level in the country? If you had different type of income distribution with certain amount of growth, what would have been the income poverty? So this is one way to separate out the effects of inequality and growth on poverty. The part which I found was lacking in most of the political economic uh, debates was no one was able to give me precise quantitative answers that yes, inequality was rising in India. So what was the impact of that on poverty? Yes, we had growth for 10 years. What was the impact of that on Indian poverty? And this counterfactual method that I developed, it's called a decomposition method where I could actually give numbers, and that's, I think, one trait of economists. They like to give answers in terms of numbers. They like to play with numbers. As I could quantify, okay, if we just had growth, poverty would have reduced by 40%. Income changes led to, say, 3% reduction in poverty, and altogether you had so much reduction in poverty. And of course, in different time periods, those signs may differ. In the earlier time period, we had increase in inequality, which was immediately after the reforms then the contribution of distribution was a rise in poverty, which was positive, and it reduced the impact of growth. But this is just giving you an example where you can split this kind of uh, exercise. Again, looking at growth and inequality, there's another project I worked on where we were looking at uh, non-linear functions. So they are not necessarily linearly impacting that 10% increase in income will lead to 1% increase in inequality. There is much more complex relation between that. And we sort of did a non-parametric uh, fancy name, kernel analysis, if you would like to see that. This requires a lot of data. So we, of course, used the World Bank's data for most of the developing countries. But we figured out, can we sort of have a projection of how these three are related? So the cube is just showing you three things on the different axes. One is poverty, one is inequality, one is growth. And you are seeing that there is a scatter all over of these different countries that you don't see a pattern which is quite straightforward uh, when you 
conduct this kind of analysis. The second broad research area I sort of uh, am getting now established is measurement. So I work a lot on different types of measurement index. I work on creating different poverty indices. One of my latest work was on looking at global poverty index. And you can see, I mean, anyone if we ask them what is happening to global poverty, especially if you ask economists, are sort of tongue-tied because it depends on what they are reading. If you look at the pictures here, you will see drastically different estimates of global poverty. One is by the World Bank economists, another is by Salai Martin or the independent economists, and they are really not matching. And these numbers get cited so often, especially when we have the Millennium Development Goals, which are going to end in another two years, that there was a lot of attention focused on these numbers. And there is, if you look at the site of the goals, you will actually see a very fancy site where every hour it's updated, this country is on track, this country is off track to reaching these goals. It's like an Olympics race, how close you are to reaching those goals. So it was sort of crazy to look at all these and you have to depend on a statistics which is so noisy. I mean, uh, who knows how you calculate global poverty. And when I went into the details of that, we realized that there are many, many assumptions made, many, many methodological simplifications done when you are calculating these numbers. There are just the poverty lines which you want to use, the $1 poverty line, the $2 poverty line, what does the $1 poverty line mean, how do you exchange or how do you translate it, right? You have the purchasing power parity exchange rates, you have the market exchange rates, what type of data are you going to use for different countries? Some countries, especially developing countries, have survey data, mostly on consumption expenditure. Most of the developed countries have income data. So how are you going to merge all these kinds of data sets? And we sort of decided, okay, let's go one by one and look at different sensitivity analysis of these poverty estimates. And can we see if we change one thing to another thing, how it's going to change the poverty measures. So among all the extensive literature giving different types of poverty estimates, we put in, we in the sense I had my co-author, we put in a project or we put in the paper, this is it with the world, world development now, uh, where we are saying none of these are authentic estimates of poverty, but they are showing you how sensitive these estimates are going to be the moment, the moment you change one simple assumption. And you will see if I have just highlighted that the headcount ratio, which is just giving us the percentage, percentage of population, which is under $1 a day, that will move on from say 25% to less than 1% if you are looking at different assumptions. So this is giving you an idea of how less you should believe with economists, right? I'm not helping my profession here. <laughs> um, from the global perspective, I have uh, the latest project I'm working with is on the U.S. poverty levels. So I'm looking at uh, poverty levels in the U.S., trying to measure them. <laughs> Here we are proposing sort of a new type of index, which is called the multidimensional poverty index. It has been recently launched as a substitute to the human development index, uh, which uh, has been published by the UNDP. And they used to publish what we used to call uh, the privation index. They have replaced it by the multidimensional poverty index now. Um, the official in poverty in the US, we sort of know, is used using the income levels, right, of families, of households. And you will have the poverty line defined for, say, a family of two adults, a family of two adults and four children, and so on. So you are mainly looking at income. Ten years back, there was a big debate that we should be looking at something more than income. Especially in the U.S., they started what we call the experimental poverty estimates. And there is a lot of literature on developing these experimental uh, poverty indices. What we are working on in this one is that can we translate the multidimensional index, which is typically used for mostly developing countries, to a developed country. And there is a need for something like this, because here I'm taking the philosophical approach of Amartya Sen, where he has tied the index to the capability approach. So this index is going to have much more axiomatic background than the experimental poverty indices or uh, what we call as, I forget the name escapes me, material deprivation indices that we have. 
in the US. So this is a very much work in progress right now. We are looking at three dimensions, choosing them very similar to the UNDP's exercise. It's mainly focusing on health, education, and standard of living. And looking at do families have health insurance, do they have disabilities, ability to speak English, and so on. So these are going to change according to countries. If you look in the case of India, ability to speak English is not going to be a poverty threshold. It's going to be, do you have minimum primary education or not? So it's going to change depending on what type of country you are going to choose in order to say that, okay, this country had, this is the minimum required sort of well-being of a family that we are looking at. And I'm looking, up, I think I'm using the ACS data for this. I'm trying to look at the index. All right, finally, let's look at what are the possible interdisciplinary research ideas which come out from this. Um, I sort of like to pitch myself well, as meddling in all different disciplines because poverty is such a thing that you can uh, contextualize it in different frameworks. You can put it in an urban framework, you can put it in a technology and lack of access to technology framework, you can put it in a conflict framework. So the US poverty measures, for example, they have led me into the literature of access to food, access to medicine, health benefits, and so on. That's one way of uh, generalizing the topic. The global poverty work which I have been doing has led me to look into segregation, especially in countries where there is segregation along caste, along race, along gender, and how that is affecting. I mean, globalization is also impacting something beyond poverty and you want to try to, again, quantify those effects. And I have a small uh, project with the Department of Defense where I'm looking at impact of poverty and inequality on incidence of terrorism. Does it really impact? And it's a growing uh, research area, again, where political scientists have found different ways of correlations, looking, depending on what type of factors they are looking at, does it really matter? for national security or not. So these are the possible research ideas. I think I'll stop over there and thanks for your time. <laughs>
But we know of plenty of anecdotal evidence as to the importance of social media amongst narrow health concerns. And the previous panel, I think, could speak to examples of that. Uh, I was emailing just well, during the health panel, <laughs> um, with a, a journalist who's doing a story on social media's impact in Brazilian political development. And we were actually discussing quantitative data that showed that the broader, the participation of political actors in social media, the better, for instance, their electoral outcome during the election. So, I guess I'm not answering the question, but to say that I think, on the one hand, the jury is out on many of these things because we don't have the robust uh, research evidence. On the other hand, and maybe to shamelessly have it both ways, it's so clear that there's such broad impact across so many domain areas, and I think that could only just continue uh, into the next few years. Well, certainly there have been success stories and failures in the Olympic Games, and I think that the uh, inequality and inclusion plays an important role on what that outcome might be. And so you might be able to judge uh, games in Barcelona of having certain positive effects for certain neighborhoods and middle class groups, but that was a process that had started well before the Olympics and so the Olympics fed into an existing urban redevelopment story. In, in Rio de Janeiro, the, it's very clear that both, both the World Cup and the Olympics, that it is disrupting for poor people, that it is um, taking the tax money of the middle class and building facilities that will be privatized and given to the elites, and that they're really losing out. And, in some ways, I'm surprised at the amount of support in places like Spain for getting the Olympic Games, given the, the uncertain outcomes that that will bring to the country. Um, Thomas Wilson from the School of Public Policy. Um, how is finding funding? I want to be an academic one day, and so finding research funding is a big issue for us. So how is, is there money in our field of international development looking for aid, aid and that kind of stuff? <laughs> well, uh, I believe Aquara many grants, um, depending on what you want to do. Uh, in your research, we had a talk by, I believe, a director of the US Department of Agriculture, and he said we have a lot of funding available and not many people apply. So it depends on, I mean, I mean, money is, I think, where, but you have to find it. Yeah, if you're coming from the Georgian tech background, you will have to spend some more time looking for it. It's not going to be very easy to find funding, but as Dr. Shinakina just pointed out, you have to find out what are the research interests of the funding agencies and then sort of align yourself accordingly and then you may be able to get it. But it's slowly gaining momentum, just the funding model, which was conventionally not a very uh, acceptable model for social sciences, but it's now changing. Yeah, the thing I would add is that for the kind of work we're discussing, it's a, it's what is not the traditional sources of funding at a place like Georgia Tech. So if most people here get federal, U.S. federal money, for instance, the NSF, or uh, DOD, 
I am funded through sources that in some cases have never funded anyone at Georgia Tech before. And so I think that that's both a challenge and maybe an opportunity. The challenge is that there's a lot of learning uh, on the ground. How do you engage these kind of, at least for tech, alternative sources of funding? Um, the opportunity is, especially in today's realities of federal funding, I think broadly is quite keen, um, and the big boss is in the back of the room, to diversify sources. And so there is, I think, an interest in kind of the sort of work that would allow one to reach to foundations, bilateral agencies, other aid agencies, the World Bank, UN agencies that, that wouldn't have been traditional tech funders because diversity right now seems like a pretty good thing in terms of funding portfolios. Kirk gets money to fly to Fiji and stuff like uh, that. I would, I would say that, that my biggest successes in funding have been partnering with other areas across campus. So I had a three relatively large grants with the School of Biology. And in some of those interdisciplinary areas, you can find a, a, spot, a space that can be both very rewarding professionally, working with people that have a different perspective, um, and also uh, opportunities for funding that would simply not be available to social scientists. <coughs> okay, I think we have to stop here. And if anyone has questions, we can ask. Thank you.